So, um, to open the ceremony, it's my pleasure to welcome our Chief Executive, Tracy Taylor, uh, to say a few words. Thank you much, Dan. So, um, hello and welcome um, to this afternoon's awards ceremony. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing all the exciting things that you great people have been getting up to um, over, over the past 12 months. And I'm sure that our guest speakers who will be delivering the awards um, will be as excited as I am to hear about all the innovation, the transformation, um, and the hard work that everyone um, in the room that are in your teams and in your services put together and do on a day-to-day -day basis. We are incredibly fortunate um, to have such great people that work um, here at NUH. I've been here for 10 months now and I've been absolutely blown away by the dedication, the caring, the commitment that have been shown by the people that I've met, um, by the services that I've come in contact with um, and from the, the services that I hear about from other people around the organisation. We have a large number of people who work day in, day out to ensure that you are, everyone is improving continuously the care that we deliver to our patients. Every single one of the 15,000 staff that work in our organisation makes a valuable contribution. And the people in your services, healthcare scientists, AHPs, pharmacy, and the technical support staff that work with you um, are an absolute um, centre um, uh, team and contributor to that. Everybody makes that contribution, whether they work in administration, whether they work in clinical support, whether they actually deliver clinical care, whether they're porters, cleaners, work in housekeeping, finance, HR. Um, everybody makes a valuable contribution. So it's really great that we're here today um, to hear about the services and the contributions that you're making and the changes, the innovations and the transformation that you're making in order to improve that care every day. The awards are called Transforming Care Awards um, and actually that is a real tribute to you and your services that you are championing the transformation agenda here at NUH. We, are, um, we have um, launched a new strategy where we have six P's, um, people, um, patients, people, partners, place, potential and performance. See, I haven't got my speech and I remember them all. Um, <laughs> so in, in, in terms of, of patients, we are really, really aiming to ensure that we are outstanding in everything that we provide. Um, the care that we deliver and the experience that they pay, our patients receive um, when they come into contact with our services and also the experience that our staff um, have of working in here. And that leads us on to our people strategy where we are really clear about supporting, developing um, our staff in the organisation, making sure that you feel valued, that you feel motivated and that we equip you with the skills, the competencies and the development that you need to do the jobs that you do as well as you do them. In terms of place, we have an ambition to invest um, in our estate. Um, we're sitting in a lovely building here today, but as many of you know, the buildings that we have across our trust vary in, in terms of their age um, and their state. So we have a, a long-term um, investment strategy to invest in the state and bring it up to 21st century environment for our patients to experience not only the care that they receive from yourselves, but also that they're actually receiving that care in an environment that's conducive um, to a modern world. But also within our place um, promise, we are investing in a digital infrastructure to use and embrace technology to make sure that you have, again, the equipment and the ability to do your jobs. We have an aim to be a paper light organisation, but also that we can actually join with our partners in our um, other providers outside of the hospital so that our patients get a better experience by us sharing information um, about them with the partners who actually also have a part in their care. In terms of performance, um, we perform really well at NUH across a wide, a wide range of performance indicators. 
There are some that we are struggling to achieve, A&E, um, for our target and our financial target, although over the last few years we have met our control total even though we have been in a deficit. We have a real big challenge this year. Um, we have a £41 million efficiency to find in terms of finance. And I know that you and your teams have been working with your divisional leads um, to ensure that you're developing plans so that we can be efficient, we can be productive, and we can stop doing things that are wasteful in order to be able to save money that we can eventually invest back in patient services. If we achieve that efficiency target this year, it will bring us back into a surplus position. And that means that we have much greater ability to attract capital and investment into the organisation that, again, we can invest um, in patient care. I'm quite sure what's happening with the microphone. Um, our fifth um, promise is around partners. The world around us in the NHS has changed. Turned off now, I have to shout a little bit. Um, the world around us in the NHS has changed. We can't any longer be an island um, in any way in, in the healthcare system. We have a requirement now to take responsibility for the system, for the po po responsibility for our populations as well as just patients who walk in our doors. So we really have a, an ambition to be a trusted and innovative partner and play a key role in the leadership of the development of a system approach um, with both our commissioners and our partner providers across the system. And last but not, not least, our sixth promise is around potential. And that is about how we invest and support and have an ambition around education, training, research and innovation. And transformation is a key part of that. Transformation is a key part and a requirement that we will need to embrace for all those promises if we are going to achieve our ambitions within those promises over the next 10 years. Transformation needs to be the day job of people because what transformation is about is continuous improvement and that is what you've embraced um, by having these awards and actually acknowledging the great things that you're doing in relation to the transformation agenda in the trust. So I'm hoping to hear some fantastic things this afternoon so I can go out of here and say the allied health professionals, the healthcare scientists, the pharmacy department are leading the way in transformation at NUH. Um, Recognising what a fantastic um, part of team NUH you are. So I'm going to leave there and I'm going to hand over to whoever, hopefully we can sort out the mic, um, whoever is, is giving our first awards this afternoon. Have fun. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so, the first category is the Pharmacy Award. Pharmacy has been engaged with transformational programs uh, for a number of um, months now. And we've been focusing on three priorities aligned with the priorities of the organisation. Medicine safety, uh, medicines flow and discharges, and also medicines finances. Um, I've been immensely proud in terms of the number of nominations received and the quality of applicants um, for this category. Uh, but there are two finalists um, who have really focused uh, their work around improving patient flow uh, with respect to medicines. And um, I guess who better to present those awards than a lady who's been passionate about patient flow and improving patient flow within our organisation, um, our Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Chief Executive Caroline Shaw. Welcome, Caroline. Now, I don't stand a chance of reaching that, do I? <laughs> I'm the smallest executive member, I don't stand a chance of that, but I will try. Um, so, first of all, it's a real privilege to be here. A huge thank you. Um, as, as you are well aware of, I'm um, oh, brilliant. Caroline, and um, the Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Chief Exec. And my job really is about 
always come do do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my job really is about running the hospital and making sure we give fantastic patient care and making sure we do it in a timely manner. And uh, the performance in the audience is the pleasure of going to a meeting in the morning. I like my numbers at the same time. Um, so, and indeed, I have the numbers to help us make good management decisions. So, when I look at pharmacy today, it's a huge, huge department. Um, doing fabulous delivery of care and doing fabulous things for our patients. And um, I've got some statistics to share with you, which I thought might be quite useful. So on a weekly basis, we deliver 1,500 TGOs. That's a huge number in effect. Um, on a daily basis, we do 964 patient reviews to make sure our patients are safe, which is absolutely fabulous. And finally, and when I looked at this, I thought, actually, I'm conscious of it, and I am, so I'm asking more questions about this afterwards. Uh, we do 68 war rounds and 33 MDTs. And we do that in a sense of spirit to do best care for our patients and the delivery. And um, the other thing before we go on to um, our videos, um, the hospital is really on a cake, isn't it? Uh, it's got lots of different ingredients, and if you're going to put it in the oven, it's going to rise. You've got to make sure that everyone pays for that. And to everyone in the audience, everyone who's a healthcare professional, um, supporting the trust and delivery of patient care, everyone who's important, and particularly our pharmacy colleagues, so a huge thank you. Because sometimes I can focus on the nurses and the medics, but actually um, it's you guys who also make that prison take or birthday cake great. It's not like I do any cooking myself, but I'm not saying I get any food so, we've looked at the shortlist and the finalists, and these are people who have really focused on improving the flow and delivering our services very differently. Um, so, we're going to go to the videos now, which is absolutely a huge thank you. You all have a right day for every day. Thanks. My name is Hannah Twigg, I'm a senior pharmacy technician within the education and training team in the pharmacy department. The concept of the pharmacy messenger role was introduced 18 months ago. This was because although the pharmacy department were meeting our targets of a two hour turnaround for completing electronic discharge prescriptions 95% of the time, there was often a delay in getting those prescriptions to the wards. That was because we were reliant on a central portering service to collect those prescriptions at set times of the day and that could result in waits of up to four hours. The audit of the pharmacy messenger role which was taken shortly after the role was implemented showed that the time um, between the completion of an electronic discharge prescription and the receipt of it on the wards was reduced on average from 92 minutes to between 9 and 16 minutes. In addition to this, our pharmacy messengers have received the training required to allow them to deliver controlled drug prescriptions to the wards, um, which means that the nursing staff are able to remain on the wards and continue caring for the patients where they're needed. If a patient has been transferred to a different ward, then John makes sure that the medication is taken to the new ward for the patient. This saves pharmacy time, nursing time, and also it saves the cost of a redispense of any medications that would otherwise go missing. The benefits of the pharmacy messenger role are clear to see. To name just a few, it improves the patient experience and patient care with regards to their medications. It saves pharmacy and nursing time, and also it saves cost in terms of any lost or resupply of medications. As a result of the success of the pharmacy messenger role, we are looking to um, produce new pharmacy messenger roles in the future. I have John with me, who is our pharmacy messenger. Everyone's always grateful for the service I provide, particularly the nursing staff with all the time that's saved. They don't have to worry about where the medication is. TTOs in particular, with patients either on discharge lounge or B49, the transport will be booked ahead of when the TTO is being prepared, so the nurses no longer have to worry about, well, where's the TTO? Is it in the cupboard? I'll just bring it down when it's ready, and they can discharge the patient as soon as that's done. Hi, I'm Patrick Wilson, I'm the Assistant Head of Pharmacy and I run the clinical and operational services within pharmacy at NUH. 
and I've nominated two of my colleagues, Melita Danby and Claire Patel, for work they've done introducing new electronic systems in terms of handover and how we work within our clinical pharmacy team. So we traditionally have used a paper handover system where we print off a patient list, go around the bed, seeing all the patients and writing down bits of information as we go around, handing that piece of paper to the next person, who then uses that to guide their clinical work the next day. There's various reasons why that's not the best system we could possibly be using. Um, there's information governance risks in terms of carrying around bits of paper, the likelihood of handing over the correct bit of paper to the right person isn't always there. And we've identified that there's better ways we can do that. So what my colleagues that I've nominated have done is they've taken it, one of the existing systems at NUH and using Nerve Centre to create an electronic handover process within pharmacy. So we've now moved entirely to doing our patient handover um, work between different pharmacists and different technicians in real time using Nerve Centre. So each pharmacist and each technician within our department has, who, who does patient facing work has had an iPad purchased and we now use that on a daily basis to do all of our uh, clinical ward work. And that means that we now have control over what people are doing, we have an audit trail for what people are doing, and it, any information regarding pharmaceutical care of our patients can be accessed by any of our clinical team at any point. So Melita, what are the advantages to you as a clinical pharmacist? Um, so first of all I'd talk about the advantages of using the iPad. So these are the iPads that we have purchased for the pharmacy team and um, being able to have one of these has dramatically improved how we work on the wards. So we have um, access to all the information at our fingertips that we need so we can access Nerve Centre for all the patient information including things like their observations. Um, we also have access to all the guidelines that we need, so the BNF app, all the trust guidelines, they're all on here. Um, other patient information such as DHR and soon to be uh, Medway and Carecentric. So this will allow us to be able to do all of our role with the patient. So we'll be able to go over and speak to the patient about their medication and obtain all the information that we need at the bedside with the patient. Um, there's a lot of scope for us to improve what we do beyond where we are now as well. The use of nurse centres is going to allow us to have um, pharmacy tasks allocated to us by nursing staff. We're going to be able to develop the way that we operate our teams even further and make the most out of the resource that we have available to us. And I'm really excited about the way that Nerve Centre is, is changing the way that our teams work and allowing us to prioritise the patients in a new and exciting way. And it's going to make a big difference to how effective our team is. Pleasure to be on the panel that I was on. 
um, even though to some people it wouldn't have been anything comprehensible, somehow it was comprehensible when I got to shortlist, and that was a fantastic experience. So thank you all so much for what you do. I am Laura now, and you see your work. I was um, nominated for this award from my band Seven uh, because after I went away to do my Masters I came back with a new inspiration for service development. Before my Masters I was, I was interested in service development but struggled to put two and two together with balancing work and that. So I went away, learned a little bit more about it, um, developed my leadership skills, quality improvement skills and teaching skills to come back with a new drive and passion for service development itself. The first project was auditing our pre-operative service um, as the current um, exercise test that we were doing was very timely, not so cost effective, costing around £5,500 a year. Um, it was relatively boring for patients and they were already here for a very long day. The second um, the project that I had a look at was we started a twilight shift. So we started to see patients following thoracic surgery, cardiac surgery and upper GI surgery to um, see if we can see them on the day of their operation. We were seeing them on the, on the day after their operation, but by seeing them on day zero, we were hoping to see if we can reduce respiratory complications and reduce length of stay and reduce physio contact time, especially in a time where all areas are having to prove their productivity. If um, successful in winning this award, um, I'd really like to use the money to go to some, to some conferences. There's the European Cardiothoracic Surgery Conference in uh, Dublin next year, which would be a fantastic opportunity. The twilight shift that I previously mentioned um, on thoracics, nowhere has done it yet, um, and seeing the day zero patients that we know of, and so this can this will really provide um, NUH to be a flagship for this and help to raise the NUH profile. So if we can go to a conference with it next year, it could be a really positive outcome for the NUH. Hi, my name is Jamie Chowdhury and I'm speaking on behalf of the CT Colonographers regarding the Rising Star Award. We're a group of radiographers that have taken on some advanced practice within the Trust with the aim of improving the service that we deliver to our patients. With the work that we've done so far, the impact we're having for our patients is we're reducing waiting times and increasing the amount of information that is available to our patients. The aim of our service is to eliminate any fear that patients have when they come through the trust and to really improve the service that they have. If we were to win this award, we would be using the funds at the end towards further training radiographers and hopefully an ESGAR registration. My name's Chloe Fitchett and I'm a physiotherapy assistant at Nottingham City Hospital. I work at Haywood House, which is the palliative care unit. I've been nominated for this award by my colleagues for um, my progression throughout the role of physiotherapy assistant and also for um, taking the role of end-of-life care champion throughout therapies. I've completed two apprenticeships within the Trust now and um, I'm working with other people that are thinking about applying for apprenticeships um, and also raising awareness of palliative care um, throughout the therapy department as well as part of my role of end of life care champion. If successful um, for this award I would like to visit other palliative care units and um, find out a little bit more about physiotherapy assistant role um, within other palliative care settings and hopefully bring good practice back to NUH.
been at um, Nottingham for two years now, and it's an absolute pleasure to do this role. It's quite a new role in the NHS, so uh, NOH has been quite innovative in introducing it. Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for the um, applicants that have actually applied to this uh, award. We have an excellent day short list, I think it was one of the hottest days of the year, and it's going to be more than that. Because I'd say that I'm extremely proud to represent the HP so, before further ado, I'd just like to um, offer a warm welcome to Melissa Sunderland, who's our Chief Nurse at the University of Hospitals, and my second lead, just to say a couple of words if you don't mind. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and thank you so much for um, asking me to be part of this. Um, as Lee said, I'm, I'm privileged to be the Chief Nurse of this amazing organisation. But um, as a double treat, if you like, I also get to be the executive lead for AHPs. So um, thank you for inviting me. I work very closely uh, with Liv and with Marjan, and also particularly uh, the people in the house, because I also have the unenviable title of Gypsy. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what that means, that's direction of infection prevention and control, or the dipstick, as it used to be known by that <laughs> organisation. So, on a day to day basis, um, my role not just touches nursing and delivery, but also um, all of the clinical professionals uh, give the amazing care that we give here in NUH. Um, and so today, to be at this event, this is really, really wonderful, and I hope it's the first of many. Um, and I would have got a posh rock, actually, if I, if I thought I did put my lipstick on. And that usually means business, so... Uh, yeah, um, but unfortunately, I've got a uh, One of the things that um, was mentioned about this grief of standing up here was sort of tell them a little bit about yourself and how, how you um, came to an approach and what you've done. Um, the night isn't long enough, I'm afraid. Um, it's 33 years this year that I've been a nurse. Hard to leave, I know, but it is true. <laughs> um, and for, for me, just being part of the clinical team has always been the utmost privilege. Um, it's great fun. It's great to be part of a team of people whose fundamental role is to make other people better. And that's why it's so great to see this kind of award because I think it was Caroline that said there's such a diversity of roles in that team. It's not just about doctors and nurses. So that's why this is so very, very important. And I've been privileged to work in, in lots of different places. I've worked all over the country. Um, you know the way some people give directions by pubs? You know, they say, you know, get turn left at the Duke's head and right at the red line. I can do it by hospitals <laughs> around the country. Um, but this, I can honestly say, is the most special organisation that I've ever worked in. And it's a huge privilege to do so. And if we just cast our minds back to six months ago when we were watching hospital and how that all made us feel and how um, social media was buzzing with all of our pride of working in this amazing organisation, I think the best bit of all though was the opportunity that gave to showcase the diversity of roles and the amazing skills that some of you have and how they contribute to patient care. And I still get stopped at conferences and meetings, people asking me, have I got an update on the patients that were um, in that programme? So that's a real marker, I think, of the impact that you have every day. So I'm very proud to be able to um, Award the AHP awards, and let's just, it is not the office, isn't it? Let's just look at the people who can show this. <laughs>
Our project is the Exosplint, an innovation for babies born with exomphalus. Exomphalus is the most common abdominal wall defect which affects 3 in 10,000 pregnancies. We designed and fabricated a protective splint that would encourage wound healing during the early stages and also facilitate normal development in these babies which wouldn't normally be handled in their early years. So the positive um, effects that the splint has had so far are for the quality of life of these babies and their families. It has also had a positive staff experience as well um, as there are fewer staff needed to turn the baby in their cot um, and to complete their cares such as nappy changes. Um, staff have also reported an increase in confidence when handling these babies because they know that the vulnerable area is protected by the splint. Through making the splint as well we've raised our profile within the neonatal unit um, here at NUH about the unique role of occupational therapy um, and we hope that longer term that um, the splint will help reduce the length of stay for these babies and that we get them home sooner. Our project's in the very early stages of development, so if we were successful, we would hopefully use the prize fund to further develop the fabrication of the splinting, and we would look into a 3D printing option to make a mould so that the fabrication became much quicker um, and the families were able to take their child home sooner. Um, and we would also like to look into what other areas are doing for babies with exomphalus, so visit other hospitals um, and hopefully showcase what we've done at national and international national conferences. Hi, my name is Jerry Chowdhury and I applied for the Transforming Healthcare Awards on behalf of the CTC Colonographers. We applied for this award originally because we've done a lot within our team to change how we deliver our service to patients. The impact that this has had on our service is that we are reducing waiting times for patients and increasing the knowledge that people have and awareness of the test. We're doing our utmost to make sure that patients have as much information before they arrive for the test to reduce that element of anxiety that they have. If we were to win this award, the money we would hope to use is to go towards further radiographer training. I'm John Midway, I'm an Advanced Practitioner Occupational Therapist in Critical Care. I've been nominated for designing an innovative occupational therapy service which delivers structured cognitive and functional rehabilitation to critically ill patients here at NUH and in particular City Campus. The project has made positive impacts on patient outcomes with regards to their cognitive function and their active daily living and we know this from completing outcome measures. Other impacts include positive patient, family and staff experience, enabling us to meet national guidelines, a change of culture within occupational therapy about assessing, treating and rehabilitating our patients early in critical care and transferring this onto the acute wards. And also in spreading the word far and wide with other trusts coming to us and seeing how we set up a service and how we continue to deliver this. And if I won the award, I would like to go to Paris for the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine Annual Conference. exciting but I've got to put my glasses on now. <laughs> okay. And the winners are Nicola Hans and Rachel Isles from Occupational Therapy. Do you want to say anything? Do you, want to? <laughs> you don't have to. No, we'd just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity and we really look forward to taking our project forward. Thank you. Well done. So the next award is the Team Award and uh, this award recognises uh, cooperation, collaboration, and team working to obviously improve patient outcomes and patient care. And um, so the finalists for the team award are. Hello, my name is Anna Bangiri. I am an SRS uh, physicist and I work in radiotherapy. 
I am part of the stereotactic radiosurgery team that has helped set up a pathway for patients with brain metastases in the East Midlands. With the help of Macmillan, we have set up a brain metastasis multidisciplinary team that has been established to ensure that consistent decision making for all these complex patients and to improve their access into palliative care. We have developed a brand new radiotherapy treatment planning, verification and treatment delivery technique using state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, due to the technical innovations, we can achieve treating the majority of our patients within two weeks. Treatment is available closer to home as the patients no longer need to travel to Sheffield as they can have the same treatment within the East Midlands. With routine follow-ups, we're trying to prevent the patients from going into hospital due to the disease progressing. Finally, we have introduced video clinics that allow patients to have an appointment with a consultant from the comfort of their own homes or while they're working using just their smartphone or tablet or laptop. This saves an average of 73 miles per travel consultation. If I'm successful in my application, I would like to attend the Navali Circle uh, International Conference in Munich, which will allow me to meet with other professionals and also see how other centres have implemented stereotactic radiosurgery in the world. Hi, I'm Catherine Stevenson, lead pharmacist for Medicines Information. Our project was to um, implement a medicines helpline for patients at Nottingham University hospitals. The aim was really that this would help to um, the patients to have a point of contact if they had any medicines related queries following discharge from hospital and also any recent outpatient um, appointments. The main impact of this project has been that um, in terms of the volume of calls, we've had 280 calls in the last year since we ran the helpline and we assessed user satisfaction by asking our um, callers on a scale of 1 to 10 where 1 is unlikely and 10 very, very likely whether they would recommend the service to family and friends um, and then from that we calculated a net promoter score which has been 100%. Um, also looking at trends of inquiries we've noticed that a lot of our inquiries, inquiries have helped patients um, improve how they take the medicine, so improve compliance, and also some have highlighted um, side effects in which we've been able to advise which medicines patients should stop, and also highlighted any medicines interactions um, with other medicines that they've been prescribed. And further steps will be to um, feedback to clinical teams within the trust if we notice any trends. We need to really now look for trends in calls and then provide any necessary feedback. In terms of what any um, any prize money would be spent on, we're going to have a new member of the team in September to go on a medicines information training course, um, which um, would make sure that he has vital skills for working and answering the inquiries within the team, and also to send um, one or more of um, my colleagues on um, a course on the UK MI seminar course, which is in September. So we would need some funding to go on that course. So we've been nominated for the team award um, and we're from Stroke. So in April 2017, multiple changes in the Stroke pathway are happening, causing uncertainty to patients and staff in the provision of rehab. As a senior stroke therapy team, we recognised this would be a challenging time, but we wanted to demonstrate as a team the positive role as leaders we had in uh, providing excellent rehabilitation and being at the forefront of service development. So our project focused on three main areas, um, streamlining the stroke pathway, um, achieving excellence in care for our patients and promoting the role of therapy within NUH and the wider community. So our impact that our project had was initially on clinical outcomes. So within the stroke rehabilitation area, we reduced our length of stay from winter 2017 to 2018 by 3.9 days. We also, within physiotherapy and occupational therapy, we achieved um, an A-star rating within a stroke national audit. Um, we also looked at patient and staff experience. So our staff experience was maintained very high. We had a highly engaged um, um, team within stroke and um, we were always oversubscribed within this period for therapy and rotations and unqualified rotations. And lastly, um, we wanted to maintain patient experience 
Um, and within our original presentation, we've got a really lovely five minute clip of one of our patients giving some positive feedback about the therapy that she had, which we're hoping to um, provide within our social media pages. We recognise that we are the senior um, stroke therapy team taking this forward, but we wouldn't have been able to do this without um, the, the therapists underneath us. And so we want to use the potential prize money to have a day's course with a specialist neuro tutor come in so that all the team can attend and learn and develop from it. So to present this award, I'd like to invite Nikki Hill, our Director of HR, to uh, present the award. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. They didn't, they didn't ask me to make a speech, but I would just like to say, as the person who has the accountability for trying to make NUH a fantastic place to work, it is a real privilege to be here where we're celebrating the fantastic work that our people do. So thank you for having me. And the winner of the team award is Anna Bangiri and Rachel Clements. Okay. Yes. Rachel's getting married today, apparently. Oh, That's why she's not here. Yes. So. Thank you. Anna, if you, you want to send, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Hello. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Claire Greaves and I'm the Chief Scientist at NUH. Uh, and I'm just going to say a few words about the Chief Scientist Award before I hand over to Dave Selwyn, the Deputy Medical Director to um, say a few words and present the award. And I'm really pleased that Dave could come along and present this award this evening because he's been a long-standing champion of the healthcare scientists across NUH. So this is actually the second year that they've done the Chief Scientist Award and it's rapidly becoming the highlight of my year. Um, in the um, Constitution, we promise that we will work at the limits of science to improve life and um, um, improve care. And I think our healthcare scientists show that we do that on a daily basis, and I think some of what you're seeing already and some of what you will see will show that. Um, my job, in part, is to raise the profile of what we do, um, and you guys in healthcare science make that really easy because of some of the fantastic research and innovation, transformation and service improvement that you do. Um, so the finalists cover a wide range of areas um, for, for new genetics procedures, offering a faster turnaround for cancer patients, <coughs> publication of a Cochrane, Cochrane review um, in audiology, um, helping prevent social isolation and loneliness, um, and the introduction of latest technology techniques in radiotherapy for our cancer patients. And as you can see from that, healthcare science is a really broad specialism. Um, but I really want to thank you all for the commitment um, that you bring and all the work that you do. To, um, and I'd like to look forward to our future achievements together. So thank you, Dave. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, so she said about 20 minutes speech, so um, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so, so it's a real pleasure to be standing uh, before you to, to celebrate all of these awards. I think this is a really strong uh, theme that's run through from the whole executive team. And it's, it's a part of a way of we're showing some appreciation for the work that all of these groups do. Um, I think it's fair to say I probably have a fair connection with all of the categories um, uh, t today, uh, uh, be that pharmacy, be that the AHPs, be that the healthcare scientists. Um, I guess my first appreciation of the healthcare scientists was when I was um, working as a, uh, a lecturer in the, in a, not this university, but a different university for a few years. And whilst it was, it was nice uh, uh, being a member of a senior common room and having some intellectual discussions with various scientists, it was really when you're trying to do some bench work and some uh, actual clinical research uh, uh, that the, uh, I first came to appreciate how important the healthcare scientists were. You can imagine as a slightly dozy clinician trying to work out how to make the equipment work or how to perfuse the samples or to do self growth cell growth techniques was perhaps a little bit beyond me and the, the, the help of the healthcare scientists 
uh, attached with that department was, was fantastic and uh, has stayed with me ever since. Um, the, the, my, my role here at, uh, at NUH, so I've been, uh, obviously support Keith in the uh, medical director's office, but also I have a, still have a clinical role in, in critical care. And I was just sitting over there sort of reflecting on that and I was appointed to uh, NUH in 1997, I think. So I've been here over 20 years as a consultant in critical care. And many of you will know that we have a huge demand on all of your services just in that one specialty. So you take pharmacy, you take AHP, you take healthcare sciences. And when I was appointed here at NUH uh, on the Queen's campus, we had uh, 12 level three or critical care beds at that time, and we've now got 21 and 20 level two beds or HDU beds. So it's been a massive change over that period of time. If you look at the city campus again, when I was, when I was first here, uh, we had seven critical care beds and, and now we've got 17. So just that, that development and that workload on you, and many of you in this room will feel that workload, it's tangible, has been enormous. But that's a testament of the important role that you all have and the contribution that you all have. And I would say that uh, the future for healthcare scientists is, is really, really bright. Really bright. There's, there's almost no end to what you, you can do. You set your, set your vision and uh, you'll be able to uh, achieve that. So much so, I've got a, I've got a daughter who's done a biomedical science degree. So, uh, so I'm sort of uh, trying to, to help with the next generation. Um, and I was trying to tie up sort of how important healthcare scientists are within the organisation because a lot of the work that you, you do is really not so much in the forelight or in the, uh, the forefront of uh, uh, and recognised. And I was trying to come up with an analogy and I was thinking uh, a few years ago I did some development work on, on the Queen's campus and we built some extra uh, beds up on E12. And um, when we were building them we were getting into the project work and it was endless fun meeting with the states and um, anyhow we're scratching our heads and uh, it sort of became a bit clear that we didn't quite have enough oxygen in the trust if we built the beds and, and oxygen is one of those things it's a bit like electricity you plug something in the wall and you expect it to be there you don't even think about it so for this project we had to build some extra oxygen tanks and do do some extra pipe work and all that sort of thing but I was thinking that actually healthcare scientists are rather like oxygen you expect them to be there but you don't quite appreciate how important they are so you are the oxygen of the hospital let's see who's been nominated My name is Lewis Darnell and I work over in Molecular Genetics and I've been nominated for the Chief for Healthcare Scientist Award. The project I was working on aimed to validate a um, new scientific assay um, that has been designed specifically for our laboratory to streamline genetic testing for um, hereditary cancers, Rett syndrome, limb abnormalities and autosomal dominant, dominant polycystic kidney disease uh, into a single assay without any additional funding, uh, laboratory staff or equipment. Uh, the new assay also represents a technological advancement, allowing us to detect a greater number of disease-causing variants um, within a single assay, which we couldn't do previously. Overall, the new assays had a large impact on our laboratory already. Um, by combining several different services into a single assay, um, it makes the testing process a lot more cost-effective and uh, saves a huge amount of staff time. It's also, in addition, that the capacity has now increased, allowing us to test greater number of tests in a smaller amount of time, uh, reducing the overall turnaround times. There's also a, a reduced reliance on additional tests to detect the same amount of um, or same variety of genetic variants. Overall, just for the tests that uh, we already um, offered in Nottingham, we're estimating to save over 900 hours of staff time per year, uh, while simultaneously allowing us to introduce a new service for autosomal polycystic kidney disease. Now, that using this single assay, Approach. We've been able to introduce this new service um, and also offer the same service at less than half the price of what we would have paid to send the testing out to another laboratory. So if I was to be successful in this award, um, I would like to uh, visit the European Society of Human Genetics Conference 
as uh, now that we've increased our capacity for testing, the uh, backlog has moved into the interpretation and reporting of results. And we need to make this process much more efficient. The large European laboratories have a greater focus on the efficiency of interpretation of variants, and I would like to attend the conference to try and understand this process a lot better, uh, improve my learning in the area, and then hopefully bring that back into Nottingham, into our department. I'm Mel Ferguson, I'm a consultant clinical scientist um, at NUH and also an associate professor at the University of Nottingham. I lead a research team looking at mild to moderate hearing loss at the NIHR Nottingham Biomedical Research Centre. Hearing loss is highly prevalent in the population. 11 million people in the UK have hearing loss, that's one in six of the population and 70% of people over the age of 70 years old have hearing loss. Um, it's a hidden disability and affects um, not only the person who has the hearing loss but also their family and friends. The main intervention for hearing loss is hearing aids. Um, they have been provided uh, free on the NHS since its inception in 1947. In 2015, a clinical commissioning group decided that they were no longer going to offer hearing aids to people with mild to moderate hearing loss. We looked at the evidence um, to see how effective hearing aids were and found that there was very little robust evidence available. To address this, we carried out a Cochrane review looking at the effectiveness of hearing aids um, in adults with mild to moderate hearing loss. Cochrane reviews the highest level of clinical evidence and are used to determine the allocation of healthcare resources and clinical decision making. We were able to demonstrate for the first time that hearing aids improve general health related quality of life. Um, the effect was small but it was still significant. But the greatest impact we showed from the Cochrane review was that they were used as a clinical evidence for the recently published NICE guidelines on hearing loss. Alongside the analysis that showed that hearing aids were highly uh, cost effective, the NICE guidelines had a very strong recommendation which was to offer hearing aids to people who had difficulties communicating and hearing. The Cochrane Review has future-proofed hearing aid provision and hearing health care in, in the NHS in the UK for at least the next five years. If I were to win um, the award, um, I would use the funds to fund me to an international conference in, in America. Um, this is the American Auditory Society, which is one of the um, biggest and most influential um, research and clinical uh, conferences um, within hearing sciences. Hello, my name is Sofia Cordolemi. I am a radiotherapy physicist uh, for the radiotherapy department in City Hospital. My application was about changing the current practice and developing a new protocol for the treatment of lung cancer patients by taking advantage of a new uh, radiotherapy technique for the dose delivery. As a sequence, this new technique provides a better uh, dose coverage and homogeneity within the target and better uh, sparing of uh, the normal tissue uh, that is around uh, from the area to be treated. So there is evidence that this increases the, um, the, control of the, the local control of the disease uh, as well as it improves the uh, patient's life. So the impact of this uh, change in practice is significant as uh, more allows more patients to uh, have access to advanced radiotherapy and the, to get the benefits from it. So this protocol has been up and running since, since May uh, and since its application the uh, numbers of the patients that received advanced radiotherapy treatment uh, has gone up substantially. So, for example, in July, 60% of our new patients were treated with uh, advanced radiotherapy technology, uh, which is the highest percentage ever. And um, this is in line with NHS's targets, which suggest that 51.8% of uh, the new irradiated tumors should, should get uh, treated with advanced radiotherapy technology. So if I win the prize, I will use the money uh, for attending a course on uh, dose modeling verification uh, organized by the European Society for Radiotherapy and Oncology. Thank you.
you're, you're all winners to me. Okay, so this is the Chief Scientist Award and the winner, Sophia. Just thank you to my department and my colleagues for the support. Uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so we're on to the final award. So we get to the point in the evening that I can't actually make an error. Um, I can't do the Oscars debacle. So. Um, so congratulations to Sophia, um, but as Dave said, uh, getting to this stage, everybody is a winner and it really showcases the great work that we do. So um, next up is the Extra Mile Award, and this award recognises staff that have performed above and beyond the call of duty. Um, they demonstrate a commitment to the profession which strengthens their teams. Um, and at times it can feel like these individuals are the ones that keep our NHS going. So, your finalists for the Extra Mile Award are... Hello, my name is Katie Teague and I am a Metabolic Dietetic Technician and the award that I have been nominated for is the Extra Mile Award. So my role is involves working alongside the dietitians with children who have inborn errors of metabolism. Many are purely dietary based and, treat and poor compliance can result in learning difficulties and irreversible brain damage. I was nominated for the Extra Mile Award for the extra support that I have given to these families and children. We have done this several ways such as organising a cookery session, which we held on a Saturday at Jamie Oliver's in Nottingham. The feedback we had was very positive and the parents welcomed the additional support. I have built strong relationships with these families, helped update resources such as newsletters, organised prescriptions, home mental feeding products and also additional telephone support. I have also worked with schools and nurseries in helping adapt their menus for low protein diets, making them suitable for the children and also very similar to what the other children would be having. And by doing these events, we hope to see an improvement in the blood levels and also help prevent the potential effects of poor compliance and the potential developmental delay. I would like to use my prize money in advancing my skills in low protein cookery. I would like the opportunity to shadow a national expert who I hope to develop my skills further with and my knowledge of low protein cookery in the hope that I will be able to use this and transfer these skills onto families and children and my colleagues. The Senior Stroke Physiotherapists, Rooster, Jane Kenny and Kate Coldwell for the Extra Mile Award. Over the last year and a half, the Stroke Pathway has undergone lots of changes due to re uh, being recommissioned to community services and throughout this time there has been uncertainty and challenges to um, our practice and the way that we deliver the service. So during this time, Ruth, Jane and Kate have continued to maintain staff engagement and development within the service. They have encouraged Band 6 projects to look at staff efficiency, which has improved patient activity levels, leading to um, better patient outcomes and reduced length of stay. They've used evidence-based practice um, and are innovative and forward-thinking to deliver the best treatment possible for patient need. Um, and the Band 6 rotation is um, people asked to stay there, um, rotation after rotation, and the Band 5s are oversubscribed. Um, which all of the above show uh, that it's such a great environment to work in um, and how Ruth, Jane and Kate have gone the extra mile to create such a great environment to be within. Um, so if successful, we would like to reward Ruth, Jane and Kate by sending them to the European Stroke Conference in Athens. This would give them the opportunity to network with other countries leading in stroke units 
um, to share practice and to bring ideas back to Nottingham to further develop our stroke unit and um, deliver the best care possible at NUH. Um, Nicola Strother, Chief Dietetic Technician for Dietetics. Um, my award is the Extra Mile Award. Um, my projects were the food discharge bags, um, otherwise known as the bags of kindness for patients to take home on discharge. Um, the Grow Your Own Garden on Jervis Pearson Ward and the NUH Memory Menu um, working with Catering. So the discharge bags are for patients who are going home vulnerable, um, have nutrition, hydration concerns, so the staple food items that get them through the first 24 to 48 hours of discharge. Um, the garden has the impact of just a place to escape for patients, um, there's an activity so it supports the end PJ paralysis within the trust um, and it's just a really therapeutic area for patients and for staff and visitors to use. Um, and then the memory menu was the menu that was designed by the patients for the patients, so we got the public to be involved in designing the hospital food menu, um, thinking about food that they eat at home, comfort foods that they like when they're ill, and childhood memories, um, and local food within Nottingham. The impact is um, just small things that actually make quite a big difference to patients, that patients will um, remember and it just supports their discharge home. Um, and their continued care, so when they leave us, they have that continued care to go home with. If I'm successful and win, my prize award would go on the Hospital Caterers Association Conference, which is in Wales next year. Tonight. 
So we're going to finish by having a few closing remarks from Tracy, but before we do that, uh, we're going to ask Tracy to draw the wrap on. Thank you so much for what you do. I hope you've enjoyed the afternoon as much as we have. Um, and have a go, Seth Jenny.